Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our special gallery talk today. I'm Andrea Zaya, the curator at NMIH, and I am joined by the acclaimed photographer, Stephen Mallon. Stephen, thank you for joining us tonight. Absolutely. Stephen's work is the subject in our latest exhibit, Machines of Interest, on display at NMIH through the spring. We would like to thank our generous sponsors and friends who have made this show possible. Bean Construction, WDIY, the Historic Hotel Bethlehem, Front Room Gallery, Artrepreneur, who provided the wonderful virtual 360 that we're going to be exploring in a few minutes, our installation crew, Emily Marcello and Frank Sattler, and Stephen Mallon himself for sharing his mesmerizing work with us. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So Stephen, your work has been featured prominently in some of the world's top news outlets, National Geographic, NPR, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, among others. And we are really honored to be showing your work at NMIH through the for the next several months and to be talking with you tonight. So what we'll be doing is we'll be going through a virtual tour of the space and we will be allowing the viewers to have an opportunity to ask some questions. We'll be talking with them then a little bit further on the end. So um, you can grab yourself a, a drink or a cocktail and relax. <laughs> and um, let's go for a stroll. What do you say, Stephen? Definitely. Looking forward to it. All right, let's let's pull up the uh... Okay. So we are in the National Museum of Industrial History here in the lobby space. And I will make this full screen. So hopefully you can see this well in the former 1913 electrical repair shop, an early picture there. And so our intro for Machines of Interest is right over here. So Stephen, we played around with a few themes, a few titles for the show. We talked about the life cycle of a machine, how machines intersect with the human world. We talked about how machines can inspire us to see the world differently. And what brings you to select this subject matter that you do? So I have been photographing machines for uh, my entire career. Um, even before I studied photography, I was running around at construction sites in North Carolina, getting yelled at by the foreman to stay out of the way of the uh, plows and everything. Uh, at some point, a friend of mine was working at a local airport and said it was fine for me to go out and shoot. And so I went down to the end of the runway and just laid down on the runway to photograph an aircraft landing. And then he got a radio in that there's someone on the runway. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, catching up to uh, somewhat current times, uh, I was approached by an agent a number of years ago about uh, producing a book. And I had been traveling and photographing uh, people and uh, illustration work and industrial landscape, uh, along with, you know, desert scapes, uh, a number of different journeys. And I really love the idea of creating a book, but I didn't feel that I had this like, cohesive body of work yet that was going to make a good like, Stephen Mallon's coffee table book. And so my wife and I essentially like sat down and started brainstorming and looking at the work that I had and realized there was this ongoing theme that I kept on coming back to, which was the recycling industry. Hmm. And I felt that that was a really interesting topic at the time also because I felt that like American industry was kind of under fire for not being environmentally friendly and a number of other issues. And so I wanted to find companies that were working towards uh, doing things in an environmentally friendly manner. And so um, I hired a writer and we put together a proposal and I reached out to a number of different clients or companies to um, see if they'd allow me to come in to photograph. And 
one of the projects that I came across was the New York City's artificial reef project, okay. which is what we are looking at here. Yes, so both of these works, both of these two pieces are from the same series, correct? Yes. And yeah. we have um, the end on the left and the settling is featured on the right. What, what can you tell us more about this artificial reefing project? Yeah, so the, the MTA uh, put over 2000 subway cars in the Atlantic Ocean over the span of 10 years. And they spent about 10 years before then uh, researching the project to make sure that it was gonna be done in an environmentally friendly way. So they worked uh, closely with the EPA, with the Coast Guard, uh, and then the tourism boards up and down the Atlantic uh, seaboard to figure out how to do this. And so at the beginning of the project, they literally told the tourism boards that you can have a barge load of subway cars for free, just pay shipping and handling, which was like $50,000. But regardless, um, it became a very popular project. And so they placed these subway cars uh, up and down the Atlantic um, both to support uh, sports fishing, but also wreck diving because people were interested in taking out charters and yeah, going to scuba dive uh, subway cars in the ocean. Oh, wow. So where are they placed? Are they really just all the way up and down the seaboard or in certain areas specifically? Yeah, there's certain reefs. There's, um, it's Maryland, Delaware, uh, Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia all have reefs. Um, some of which are public. And then there are a couple that are private in the sense that um, the, the state monitors them for fish population, but it's not accessible for like fish tours, mm -hmm. fishing tours. Hmm. Interesting. So these two pieces here, we see the, the machines that were actually used to place um, some of these cars then into into their new home in the next stop Atlantic, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So and, yeah. yeah, actually uh, one funny little story about that is that at the beginning of this project, I think that they were just using um, like a bumper system. Like they had put together some tires on the edge of a forklift and it was causing some damage to the cars. And so they had their metal shop um, custom weld this giant like forklift attachment that they put on this caterpillar to um, pick up the subway cars all in one uh, one motion to maintain the structural integrity. Mm -hmm. And so where were you positioned while you were capturing these images? So these images are both shot from a crew boat. Uh, the process was is that because the tugboats are pretty slow, like they're only moving at about four knots an hour, um, it wasn't cost effective to pay the operators and the two other guys that were on uh, deck to travel down by barge for those hours. So what they would do is they would drive down either the night before or just the morning of and get in a separate little crew boat and then take that out to the barge. And there's a ladder that's welded into the side of the barge and they would just climb up that and then start disattaching the steel cables that are holding the cars in place and start up the excavator, which takes a couple of minutes for it to warm up. Um, and so when that happened, the crew boat had to stay on site anyways to pick these guys up when they were done. And so I was able to ask and direct the captain of the boat, like, put me here, put me there, depending on the light and what was going on. So I was able to isolate these photographs. Yeah, they're fabulous. And then we kind of go from looking at this massive open sea um, to a textured close up. And what are we seeing here in this piece? And then also the next piece, part of that series that we'll look at. Yeah, so this is uh, another chapter in the recycling industry. This was shot during a residency in Grand Rapids, Michigan that was partially funded by a grant from the um, NEA. And um, this was done, yeah, in this recycling plant um, operated by um, a company is called Padnos. It's a family owned business. And uh, they let me in to photograph a bunch of the different uh, materials that they have. And so these are bales of aluminum siding that have been brought in and then put into a, a baler and just 
crushed and tied together with some steel wire. Mm -hmm. And so how about how high were these bales or how large were they typically? I want to say that each bale is about two by six feet. Oh, wow. Um, that's a good question. I don't remember exactly the scale, but they were, they were pretty large. Yeah. And so, you know, with some of your pieces, I find what's interesting is this is scale because we're looking at things and especially here, there are some objects here that we are familiar with and we're seeing them in an unusual setting. So this was also part of your recycling project as well, right? Cans. Yeah, this was the kickoff, actually one of the earlier images of the uh, project. And this was photographed at a different recycling uh, place uh, off the coast of New York on Shelter Island. And yeah, this was just another one of these situations where they're collecting aluminum and then putting it into these bailing machines uh, compressing it and then strapping it together with a steel wire to make it easier to transport, to then go back to a uh, foundry to melt it down into uh, aluminum that they can recycle. And I'm also um, kind of, um, it's striking how you're able to find yourself in these places where so many of us perhaps would not be authorized to be. And so, you know, I know we talked about this at the opening a few weeks ago, but it's sort of like experiencing through your lens, we kind of jump the fence mm. and we're able to get an inside look on, on some of these activities and, and what it looks like in these industrialized um, sites as well. So I'm gonna see if I can look up here. Okay, so um, as we, um, or we return then to the artificial reefing project subject matter. We ask our visitors to sort of look up. There's a, I'm going to see if I can get a little bit of a better vantage point. Very cool piece called Mind the Gap here. Oh. And <laughs> just sort of slid right back through. up. <laughs> but, and then on the other side, we have another one too. Let me back up again. So Mind the Gap, this is probably, um, you know, another one of your iconic pieces. Let's go over here. And it's, it's you know, interesting to steer this. Car. Right. <laughs> yeah. So what can you tell us about this piece? Yeah, so this is uh, one of the images that was shot from the uh, yard in uh, New York in Inwood. Um, it's at the northern tip of Manhattan. And what they would do is they would bring in these older subway cars and pull out the, uh, the seats, the windows, the doors, the control panels, like basically anything that they could either like recycle and also stuff that would potentially break off of the car when it goes into the ocean. And they would load these onto a barge. And the, the cars themselves are basically sitting on the, the wheels and the motors directly underneath. And there's just like a, a cotter pin um, holding the whole thing together between the two. And so they pull that out, you stick your steel cables underneath and they've got a giant rotating crane on a barge and they would pick up the subway cars and then load it up onto the barge. And like at some point there would be too many of these motors and axles kind of piled up. And so they would switch the crane attachment out and then pick up the motors and put those into a separate barge because they're full of iron and copper. So it was a different uh, recycling process for those. They didn't want to put those into the ocean. Yeah. So yeah, this was one of the iconic photographs that I shot um, towards the beginning of the project, like at in 2008. Wow. Um, but I do love this image. It's got, it's just absolutely wonderful color. And yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a fabulous piece. And then as we, as we enter in through the gallery space, we will turn around and see if we can look up. Well, we're not in there far enough yet. And we've got another piece from this series. This is called Pool. Yeah, so this is, don't take us out yet. <laughs> Let me see if I can get a better. <laughs> Right here, here we go. This is pool. This is one of my favorite pieces. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so what would typically happen with the cars is that when they like flick them off of the side of the barge essentially is that they would land like 
face first in a way. So it's like, blap. and then because they're bottom heavy, they would flip back up. And so this was one of those moments where the cars flip back up and now the water is starting to kind of encase. And this is another one of the images where I think that people um, that have ever ridden New York subway cars will have a little bit of a sense of vertigo because you can literally see the pole that you would normally be holding onto during rush hour, like inside there, except the fact that it is encased in water and about to be dropping down to the bottom of the ocean. And so probably a lot of viewers, especially New York City um, people, like as you're mentioning, people who are using commuter, commuting on subways every day, they probably have a very emotional reaction. Oh yeah. A lot of these pieces, you know. Um, yeah, I've had a number of people uh, comment and purchase these prints just that are uh, expatriates from the city because they've got such an emotional attachment yeah. to being on the subway and uh, yeah, and also the families that were involved with the with the reefing project. Um, I think, yeah, someone, uh, their family actually had a their name welded onto the side of one of the cars because they were one of the, the backers of the project. Oh, wow, cool. And so we also see a couple pieces here. We're still, we're still in the water. We're still looking at maritime um, applications. And we've got, hopefully I don't go too far. Okay, perfect. We've got this really interesting Mr. Gibbs, and this is the SS United States. What can you tell us about this project? So yeah, so this was a commission from National Geographic, um, an absolute dream assignment of mine. And I was able to photograph the uh, ship for about three days uh, for Nat Geo back in 2016. And there is a foundation uh, that is working hard to keep the SS United States out of the scrapyards and get it repurposed or retrofitted. There was a cruise line, I think at one point that was interested in possibly going in and retrofitting this to put it back into service. And they changed their mind because it just became, I think a little bit too cost prohibitive, but they do, uh, they're as far as I know, still um, looking for a permanent home for the ship where it could be, uh, turned into like an event space or a floating hotel, you know, there's a couple of different possibilities. And so at one point, this was the fastest ocean liner in the yes. world, is that correct? Yeah, and um, so here again, we see this transition of this lifespan of a machine, you know, like with the subway cars, people are using this car, uh, the train to commute to work and they're experiencing that. And then it moves on to a different, uh, transitions into a different kind of life cycle at, later on. And we see that here too with the SS United States, the fastest ocean liner at one time. And I think it was also retrofitted for use um, by the military. It was, it was an option. It was going to be a uh, backup uh, troop carrier if they had to go into a, another uh, land war in yeah. Europe. So, because the ship was like at the edge of jet engines. And so ships were still, you know, the first and foremost way to move uh, troops and people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's interesting then, you know, what will the, the ship become then later yeah. on? And, and we wish them luck. Also, I should mention to the viewers, there are these little hotspots that you'll see in the 360 and you'll have an opportunity to um, go through this then I think we have a, a link to it on the website and you can learn more. There's a very cool documentary, a, a short film about the, the ship as well. And then this next piece, dry dock. Yeah, so this uh, is also another uh, photograph from uh, Philadelphia. These are actually uh, both shot in Philly. This was uh, down by the, uh, by the piers and then the dry dock is inside of the uh, Navy yard. And this was shot, uh, while I was photographing another artificial reef because they sank the uh, USS Radford, which was an American destroyer. Uh, and they sank that off of the coast of Delaware as well for part of this artificial reef. Sorry. And just next to where they were prepping this ship, there was this amazing 
uh, dry dock. And it wasn't connected to the project, but I asked the people that were working there, I was like, is it okay for me to photograph this as well? And the people that owned the dock were like, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so I'm standing on these like giant watertight doors that they basically, um, they use pumps and everything to flood the area. And then we'll bring in ships and then pump the water back out to do maintenance and uh, painting and fix any issues that may have uh, been affecting the hull. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when I look at this, it sort of reminds me of like a Mayan ruins, like a ball court or something like this. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. I, yeah, I, I love how this image looks like it's an archaeological site. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, it's still yeah. very warm to my heart. Very interesting features there. And then we have this also a um, video feature inside the exhibit. And I'm just going to play a few seconds here so that people can check this out. But this was an opportunity that you had to film a, a bridge being moved. Yeah, so this is a uh, time-lapse film that I uh, produced following the delivery of the Willis Avenue Bridge uh, that was built outside of Albany and then they towed down by a uh, tugboat and then brought up and replaced the old bridge. And then one night they literally like just changed over the traffic cones and you then started going over the new bridge. Wow. So this film has been in half a dozen different film festivals, um, was featured in the Wall Street Journal, it actually it got picked up by uh, the Sci-Fi sci Channel at one point, wrote a blog post about this, about the engineering. Mm -hmm. And I have just got a lot of strong emotional ties to this because this also got me into working for the New York City Department of Transportation um, that has been an, an existing client ever since. This is incredibly cool. And then as we, let me see if I can, I'm gonna back up just a little bit so we can get a better vantage point. And let's, let's take another look. We're back at the artificial reefing project. We have um, Stack and Donegan here featured. And so we see they're waiting, I'm assuming, to be uh, in, the, in the snow and um, they're on their way to perhaps be loaded up onto the barges or? They, yeah, they're actually, uh, in both of these images, they're on the, on the barge at this point. And uh, Stack, which is the image on the bottom, I'm shooting from the crane. And this, it's on a, a rotating crane, so they're operational. So I literally only had like seconds at a time where the camera was actually facing the subway cars to get this composition. And then Donegan, which is just, it's a railroad term that I picked up when I was looking for titles. And it's like, the, it's the term that they use for like temporary offices when they convert like a box car or a rail car into a temporary office. They, it's, the slang or term is for, is Donegan, which is where that name came from. And so I also, I love this image just because uh, both the palette and just the whole like, you know, optical kind of like disconnect with the fact that you're looking into a subway car that now has snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then there's another subway car, but then you see another subway car. And it's just like this, this moment in time that never really exists anywhere else, um, except when they were being loaded like this. Yeah. Very cool. It's fascinating. And many of your, all of these pieces are available for sale too as well. So anyone who is interested to learn more about that, we can, we can show you how to access that. And then our next three pieces here are actually from, also from this series with recycling as, yeah. as all of these are. And we have the claw here. And so again, we have another object that once we're looking at this for a little while, we see, oh my goodness, there's part of a vehicle. 
and uh, it kind of plays around a little bit with scale and, and perception. Yeah, I, I love the action and color and tension that is happening in this. Um, it's my homage to Pixar. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the reference. Um, but yeah, what a, I, there are kind of two areas that I default into photographing, one of which is my um, painter in denial. Um, I am a horrible painter. So whenever I can make photographs that look like paintings, like some of the abstract work of the aluminum, I'm really feeding my soul. And the other thing that I found that I've been really attracted to is these moments, which I like kind of categorize as like violent recycling. And I really like the energy and the tension of what's happening here. So you have this giant hydraulic claw that the car is literally like, you know, grappled into pretty, you know, violently and it's just swinging, you know, and it is in the process of being loaded onto this giant conveyor belt that is then feeding it into these giant uh, wheels that have huge teeth on it that is then crushing all of the metal down. And then through air vents and magnets, they separate out the uh, steel and aluminum because it all goes through different processes for recycling. Mm -hmm. And so I'm imagining, you know, all of the sounds that you're hearing as a photographer capturing this moment, it must have been so loud and. Yeah, I, I wish I had a, a video crew with me at all times following yeah. me. So yeah. that is that is the goal in the future. And it's almost this beautiful moment. It's it's like probably uh, this snapshot in time that's that is, um, you know, a moment that is there's tranquility in some regard as this thing is then just being lifted off into its next transformation yeah. but uh it's very interesting how you were able to ca capture this too thanks yeah and we have um two other pieces here i'll see if i can back up and move over to the side this one i do now all right and these are also from the recycling. I believe this is aluminum siding too. Yes. So this is the other uh, bale that I photographed. And again, it just, I was so attracted to these objects that I needed to uh, show both of them when they were collected in multiple bales. And then also this bale as a standalone object, um, you know, there's, Store, you know, there is a connection to, you know, suburbia and home life and generations here because this is aluminum siding, you know, that it was most likely, you know, likely from a house of, you know, for unknown reasons was torn down, you mm -hmm. know, either by storm damage or maybe there was, you know, there was a fire, the house was sold and they're, you know, they're renovating, but, you know, you don't know what the, the history is of the metals here, but that Again, the color and the texture of both of these images is still like just very rewarding for me. Yeah, that's interesting. There's all sorts of angles um, going on there. And this is also another one of those pieces you could just continue looking at and seeing something else more interesting um, that is attracting the eye. And this, the piece hanging above it here, um, <clears throat> This, this is an interesting piece because we sense that there's some movement happening here. And this is called UBC. Yeah, so it, it turns out that that is the technical term for those drink tabs off of, the, off of your soda can. Yeah. Um, and I had, they're, they're, this object is on top of a pallet inside of like a nylon bag that looks like these things have like shot off and created this like vortex on the inside of it. And I still need to do a little bit of research to find out um, when these were being collected because I was under the impression that it was post-industrial, that it was like, these are the tabs that like were rejected when the cans were being made. But yeah. somebody pointed out that because of the density of the metal is different, that it's possible that these were actually being separated off of the cans intentionally. Wow. So I need to do a little bit of research to find out what, um, yeah, what stage these were uh, photographed at. 
And did I hear you mentioning that this particular part is really only manufactured in one place? No. No. <laughs> that was something else. <laughs> So yeah, this is a really cool piece here too with some elements of color in there as well. That's yes. really great. And then um, we have uh, this blue ribbon over here. Let me see yeah. if I can get in front of this piece a little bit better. So that is the name of the award that the ship won for its speed record for uh, crossing from Europe to New York. Okay. Um, and what is it was it left either from London or Paris. I can't remember which the uh, port was, but um, yeah, that's the speed record that it still holds to date. And what's interesting is that I uh, just see here that um, Nick mentioned that the SS United States is still the fastest ocean liner in the world, and it holds uh, one world record. So very nice. Yeah, the thing I love about it is that it was faster uh, in reverse than the Titanic was going forward. Oh my gosh, I just always think that's such an interesting it, little tidbit. <laughs> and it is down at the Port of Philadelphia currently. If anybody is interested in also taking a look at that massive vessel, and um, we yeah, they do. Offer, I think they're offering uh, tours. There's a foundation uh, that you can connect with. Um, if you're interested in helping out. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, weeks 297 here. Yes, yeah, so this is also one of the first uh, images from the project. Um, I'm on the crew boat and we've literally just dropped off um, the guys that are gonna be untethering the cars and operating the excavator. Mm -hmm. And so the, I'm backing away from this and I just chose, um, this image without the tugboat in the frame because I liked the isolation and, and kind of like mystery of this thing just being out on the ocean on its own. Yeah, yeah. Where is it going? Yeah. That's fascinating. And I, I really enjoy the way that you were able to capture some of the movement in the ocean as well. Thanks. It's really, it's quite choppy where you were. Yeah, it's... Uh, I learned a couple of things on this uh, project about uh, shooting from a boat, one of which is not to edit your photographs in the back of your camera while you're on the boat. Yeah. Um, the other is just be careful about what your breakfast is. Oh boy, yeah. The bacon, egg and cheese from the deli was not the right choice. Yeah, oh no. <laughs> That's great. So you, you just have had um, the most interesting experiences doing your, doing your work. It's fascinating. And we have another piece over here. This is the USS Zumwalt. Yep. There it is. She coming? And um, it is, it looks like it's huge. This is also in dry dock, correct? Yes, so this is uh, the USS Zumwalt that was built in the uh, shipyards in uh, Bath. Uh, in the state of Maine. Uh, this was on assignment for uh, Smithsonian Magazine a number of years ago. And um, I just, I love the uh, energy. Uh, I love the angle. I love being in shipyards in general. I just think it is such an interesting uh, work environment to be seeing these uh, vessels being uh, put together or decommissioned. You know, there's just so many interesting elements that are going on. Um, I think the third thing that I get sucked into really easily is sparks. Um, anytime that there is welding going on, I will always be trying to capture that. And uh, this is one of those images that I'm just really uh, pleased with how this turned out. Yeah, there it looks like there are just many different stories of activi activity that are going on here. And yes. Yeah, it's pretty multi-layered. It's fascinating. Um, and then we have this interesting, I'm going to back up again on this, and we've got one of your latest series featured in our special little alcove here yep. and talk about, you know, how do you capture these images? 
Um, this is from a few selected works from Passing Freight. And so how do you decide where you're going? How do you decide what you're going to um, try to capture at that moment? And how does this work out for you? Because these trains are moving. Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a decent amount of uh, patience, uh, quite a bit of coffee and um, a couple of like uh, slightly sleepless uh, nights or mornings. Um, because of the scale of the objects, I am shooting these um, primarily at sunrise and sunset. So mm -hmm. I will find locations um, through referrals and Facebook and um, Google Earth has been incredibly um, helpful. Um, finding these places where I can photograph the trains without any, uh, any obstruction, any trees or anything in the foreground. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I uh, go with uh, my tripod and a wide angle lens and I wait. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been really fortunate. Um, I've found uh, a number of different locations and I am continuing this project to the day. Yeah, this is, this is great. You have a couple of really interesting pieces here too, where you're, you're able to see through the car. So we have an open car carrying lumber here on the bottom. Um, the rail box to the left with the door open, and then we're actually seeing the desert scene behind it. Yeah. Um, and this one was interesting. We, I think you were just, that's as far, that's as close as I can get in here. Um, but this one was something that you were able to, um, you were able to capture this a few months ago, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was, I shot this just yeah. before we installed the show. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an undercutter. It's a, if I remember all the details correctly, it is a ballast replacement machine. So what it is doing is going through and like scooping the, um, gravel that is next to the ties and then replacing it with fresh gravel to help support the, uh, train tracks that are on it without having to actually remove the tracks. And so this was just in transit. It wasn't actually operational when I shot it, wow. but um, the machine itself is like three frames of this. I don't have, I mean, we could probably do it at one point, but this was just like my favorite part of this because this was like a very like steampunk, you know, war of the, you know, machines. Um, what was the, um, what was the recent film where the cities were actually walking and consuming the other towns? Oh, um, not sure. <laughs> but it looks like there's some conveyor belts there and it's just, you know, would be very interesting to see this in action. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty complex. Yeah, and it looks as if some of the scenery also is from the West. Let me see if I can back up a bit. Yeah, so these are shot in uh, New York, New Jersey, Virginia and California. Wow. Yeah, some of the pieces. Oh, let's go back. Let me go back again. Sorry about that. So some of these other pieces that are a little bit high up there. Um, beautiful work. Yeah, I love how those two pieces work together. So the one on the left is from um, just a public park uh, next to Bear Mountain, uh, the Bear Mountain Bridge in New York. And then the image on the right is from uh, this area called the Cajun Pass, where there are, I want to say like six different freight lines all coming together, heading towards the uh, ports in California. And so there was a lot of train traffic. And I love that locomotive that came by because it, it must have just come back from a retrofit. And I wasn't sure if it was uh, new or not, but then we, we searched the uh, serial number on the side and it was it was built in the mid nineties. But I think, yeah, just it must have come back from being freshly painted and, and sent back out for probably another 10 years of service. Yeah, it has a nice uh, paint scheme on there, sort of reminds us of the Freedom Train series from the Bicentennial. Yeah. Um, yep. we zoom in, it has a Building America theme on that. Yeah, great pieces. And they all work together so interestingly. Yeah, I love how this looks. Mm -hmm. 
And we also have, let me, let me go over in front here. We have gear pile. And this is another one of those pieces where I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm not quite sure how large the objects are, the subject matter that you are shooting is. Are these really small? Are these large gears? These are pretty big. These are all, I think, transmission parts from what I can tell that have like, I think been kicked out because they were uh, too big to be crushed from the, uh, those giant wheels. And so this, this pile was like 20 feet high. Wow. Um, and I was standing on a, on a, like a divider wall. Like they've got like parking spots for the different materials that they're collecting. And I found this area that I was uh, attracted to just because of the, the shape and the color palette and then waited again uh, for the light just because they're such large objects. I have a tendency to shoot in either like semi-cloudy days or right at like the golden hour where the sun's dipping down to the horizon to give this like softer, more diffused lighting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting to hear you telling us a little bit more about some of uh, the technical background and how you set this up or how, what you're looking for. We're going to be doing another talk with you in a few weeks or so um, about more so of a fine art talk, more so of a, um, you're going to give us a little bit of an insight into the equipment that you're using and how you're setting up these shots technically too. Okay. So that, that will be really um, fascinating. Yeah, there's a lot of texture. And then of course, with the, um, you know, the way that they're being placed on this pile, it's just, it's remarkable. It's, it's almost hard to believe, you know, this is a 20 foot high pile of gears. Yeah. Yeah. This is like a side detail of it. You know, it's like, a yeah, probably, you know, like a four by eight foot section of it, but yeah, there, it's pretty massive. Yeah. And it's quite sculptural just happens to be, you know, there yeah. And so, so this is our show, Stephen, would you like us to go back to any of the pieces and do a little bit more of a, of another look, or maybe we can look at some of the questions. Yeah. Let's take a look at the questions that we have. Okay. Um, Okay, we have a comment, a wonderful juxtaposition to these pieces, aside from being incredibly visually interesting. Um, Thank you. Yes. And somebody asked what year the MTA subway car sinking photos were taken. So I shot it uh, over the span of about three years from 2008 till 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, the project finished in 2010. I came into it uh, towards the end of the project. Yeah. That's great. And do you know if they're still continuing this? They are not. They're not. Um, they retired all of the older cars that they uh, wanted to do this for. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, I think that they went back to a traditional recycling of the cars afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have another question for additional details on how you shot this photo. So I am up in a uh, cherry picker. Um, when we got to the shipyard, um, I asked about how, how to get to the front of the ship, essentially. And they have these uh, super tall uh, cherry pickers and I think the lift that I was in had a hundred foot um, lift capability and we were we were instructed to keep it at 60 and uh, but that was fine because that got me basically like straight on to the the front of the ship incredible okay this is great yes yeah, so if um for those of you who are interested in hearing more about technical aspects, like I had mentioned, uh, Stephen's going to be able to talk with us again in a few more weeks. Um, are you working on any projects currently? 
Um, the passing freight is still ongoing. I've been revisiting that location in New Jersey uh, about once a week for the past like month to two months. Uh, I have a project uh, starting on Monday um, that I'm going to be working on for a couple of weeks that I actually can't talk about just yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very curious how that is going to develop. Um, but the main, yeah, the main focus and interest right now is to keep expanding uh, these images of the freight cars. I have about 60 right now that I'm really happy with, and I want to build that collection out where we can do some walls of 20 or 30 of these images, and then also play with the possibility of doing, you know, a grid like this, but only of box cars hmm. and only of locomotives. Um, and just keep, uh, keep expanding that because it's a really interesting module project for me because it can, you know, organize this by its functionality or by its location or by palette or just randomly, you know, figure out which images we want to put together. Um, so it's still really enjoyable for me, when it, especially because um, it's getting a little bit harder. Um, I think I got really lucky at the beginning capturing some of these and now finding unique locomotives, unique uh, boxcars is, is becoming a little bit more challenging. Um, and I've also got to travel a little bit. I've kind of shot almost everything that I can find on the, uh, like close to my house. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so like I've got an application out for a grant. Um, if that comes through, that'll definitely help with uh, funding some trips uh, further out into the Southwest. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you ever shoot on very historic railroads? I haven't to date. Um, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to it. You know, if um, if somebody needed a photograph of Big Boy, I would definitely be interested in going out and doing it. Yeah. Um, we have another question um, concerning the Norfolk Southern caboose down here on the right. Yes. And where was this shot at? So this was in uh, Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I was really um, happy to see it uh, in action because I thought that all of the cabooses had been retired. And the research that I did um, said that basically these cabooses are being used still when uh, there's one of two things happening is that they, they're used to um, shuttle uh, crew around yards because this was not too far from uh, one of the switching yards. And the other possibility is that if the, um, the load is, has some hazardous materials and they want to have like special, you know, a crew with the train on site in case something goes wrong. Hmm. So I don't know which situation was happening there. When this passed me, it wasn't going incredibly fast, but it didn't come back. Um, I didn't see it again when I was shooting because it's, it's the spot in uh, Richmond that I had photographed like more than 10 years ago before, before I even begun this project. And it's like eight train tracks wide um, because it's such a, there's such a big uh, switching yard close by. Yeah. And I remember the last time that I was there, I was, I was I was shooting film at this time. So I had my four by five set up and um, a train had come and parked across the road and was sitting there for quite a while. And then a cop showed up. And I was kind of like, oh God, am I in trouble? Am I not supposed to be here? You know. And then she was like, have you seen the locomotive? And I was like, no. She had shown up because she wanted to give the driver a ticket. Oh. Because the trains are not allowed to block the roadways for more than a certain amount of time because of emergency services. Mm -hmm. Because if like an ambulance shows up and they can't get there, you know, you're potentially putting somebody at risk. And so I just always remember that one moment where <laughs> it's like, they're not here for me. Oh, great. Well, that's good. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is wonderful. Um, Stephen, we appreciate your time and uh, you giving us a little bit more of the backstories of some of these amazing pieces. Uh, like okay. I had mentioned, the show is going to be up for for the next several months. So you, anyone who has an opportunity uh, to stop down at the museum, you can see them in public. 
um, in person. So um, I'd like to thank you again, Stephen, for being part of our special talk tonight and for taking us on this really fun tour. We do have an online museum shop. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about how to purchase <laughs> some of the pieces, I have my mugs here from the Passing Freight collection. Um, there are very cool mugs, totes, face masks, all sorts of great product that you can find on our online shop. Uh, you can, it's, it's a fun way to enjoy shopping at home. And while you are on the NMIH website, you can check out some of the virtual programs under our virtual museum tab. We have a lot of exciting virtual events that we're planning for you over the next several months. Coming up next on December 3rd at 7 p.m., we're going to be debuting our Meet the Manufacturer series. Uh, a very special guest, Dr. Stephen Tang from Orishore Technologies will be with us. You'll be able to learn more about their efforts to battle on the front line developing testing for COVID-19. And we invite you to learn more about Meet the Manufacturers, about machines of interest in Stephen's work and other exhibits and programs by visiting um, nmih.org. You can also send us an email at info at nmih.org. And I really appreciate you all spending time with us this evening. So thank you, Stephen. My pleasure. Thank that you was all. Fun. Yeah, thank you. Have a great night.